Hello and welcome back to the channel. Uh, it's been a little while since I've uploaded a new video here. Uh, I've just been using my spare time lately to create some new lessons for my upcoming Solutions Architect Associate course. Now, I just finished a new domain in the course around uh, management and governance. Uh, I just have a bunch of introductory lessons around different AWS services and features covering the management and governance domain uh, focused around the Solutions Architect Associate scope. Uh, now, I was hoping for some feedback on those lessons, so I thought I'd share them here on YouTube. Uh, kind of chain them all back to back together here and uh, hopefully get some comments and uh, let me know what you like about the videos and especially what you don't like uh, and then I can make the future lessons even better. Now I'll include the video chapter timestamps in the description below uh, just so you can easily jump around to the different lessons if you want and review certain ones uh, but again I really appreciate your feedback in the comments. Uh, these are again just introductory lessons uh, they don't go into too much depth at this point I'm saving for all that for uh, later domains of the course itself. Uh, but uh, in terms of just introductory lessons, really appreciate your feedback. Uh, thanks so much for watching and let's get into it. In this section of the AWS platform introduction domain of this course, uh, we'll start looking at the various services and topics that provide management and governance capabilities to our AWS infrastructure and environments. We'll be covering off an introduction to all the AWS services and concepts in the exam guide related to management and governance. Now, keep in mind that this section here is just a start to introduce some of these topics and services to you. Uh, it's completely normal and expected that a lot of the content here will be completely new to you and may not make a lot of sense even after watching the lesson. Um, you won't have too much of the you know, context yet, especially if you're new to AWS and haven't used or heard about a lot of these services before. We'll also be jumping around a lot to uh, different topics, learning little chunks of the exam scope in isolation. We're essentially dumping out a box of uh, a thousand puzzle pieces onto the table and starting to look at each one randomly in this introduction domain section of the course. As you progress through the lessons here, you'll start to slowly understand how you can organize the pile of puzzle pieces a bit identifying how they can be grouped by color and starting to see the image that we're trying to make. Uh, you'll also start to fit together some of the edge pieces to give us a reference or anchor point in our minds as we learn more and more material. As you work through the course and we get into more depth in the same lesson topics later on, uh, we start filling in all those missing pieces in reference to those anchor points and we start to understand how these pieces all fit together in the context of one another. Again, just approach this section like we're skimming through the table of contents in a few chapters in the textbook to just get a general preview of what's in store. As we move on into other introductory sections of the course and the uh, deep dive domain of the course, you'll slowly start to become more familiar with all these topics and services and see how they all fit together to build real world scenarios. You're building your knowledge here layer by layer as we go through the lessons, building up our understanding and our memory associations between all these new concepts and material as efficiently as possible. Now, I know the scope of the AWS exam and all these topics and services can feel overwhelming at first, but I urge you not to get discouraged at this point. Uh, just stay consistent with your study here and just trust that all this stuff will click together very soon. Hi everyone and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll start introducing you to AWS accounts and the basic functions they provide to customers. So what is an AWS account? Well, first a key distinction to mention here is that we're not talking about AWS user accounts that uh, manage the AWS resources. We're talking about the AWS account itself, which provides a logical container for your AWS resources and a security boundary as well. It's like a virtual space where you can store your cloud computing resources in. Uh, such as your Amazon S3 buckets, uh, Amazon EC2 instances, and Amazon RDS databases. Now, an AWS account is also a security isolation boundary for the AWS resources created within that account. Now, before you go and skip ahead into the course here and create your own AWS account, there's a few important details to be aware of with AWS accounts. First, you'll need a valid credit card to open the new AWS account. Uh, there's a free tier of select AWS services you can use, but even if you tend to just use the free tier eligible services, you still need a valid credit card to create and use your AWS account. Now, we'll go over the account creation process in a lot more detail 
and uh, talk about the free tier of AWS services later on in the course. We'll also be discussing why you may want multiple AWS accounts instead of just one. Uh, we'll get into that really soon. Uh, but just know that you can use the same credit card as a payment method on multiple AWS accounts. The unique identity used to create each AWS account is just an email address. Uh, every AWS account will be tied to a unique customer email address. It's this email address that's used for important communications from AWS uh, about your account for billing and different administration purposes. This unique email address also serves another really important function as the main account user identity. This account email address is also used for what's called the account root user. This root user is a really special user in that it has full administrative control to do anything uh, within and to the account. It also has special account billing and administrative capabilities, like being able to change uh, billing details of the account and uh, also completely delete the AWS account itself. Now, just remember that this root account user is essentially the uh, god mode administrative user on the account. Uh, and it's really important that we have very secure credentials in place and follow the AWS best practices for the root user. Uh, such as enabling multi-factor authentication. Now, there are some situations uh, within AWS organization structure where uh, the AWS root user permissions can be limited a bit, uh, but for now, consider the AWS root users to have unlimited administrative control over the AWS account. Now, since the root user is a special user uh, for the account with very broad permissions to uh, really essentially do anything within the account uh, or to the account itself, we never want to be using this root user for just day-to-day -day operations. AWS has another service called Identity and Access Management, or IAM, where we can create and use different user identities, where we can define specific groups, roles, and policies to restrict the IAM user permissions. Now, when first creating an AWS account, uh, we get into a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. Uh, we create the new account, and we only have the root user to start off with and we're forced to manage the AWS account with this root user, since it's really our only option at that point. Uh, but we're not supposed to be using this uh, root user for our day-to-day -day activities. So one of the first things we should do when creating a new AWS account is to use this root user to create our first IAM administrative user account. Uh, and then from there forward, we'd be using this administrative IAM user to manage the AWS account and even create more IAM users as needed. The root account is only really needed for very specific uh, account level billing and administrative configuration changes. Uh, we should ensure that the root account credentials are very secure, uh, following the best practices, and again, only used when necessary. Now to recap a bit here, uh, an AWS account again is our security boundary around all the resources within it. Uh, the account also serves as a logical container for billing and administrative purposes. Everything within an AWS account is completely isolated to other AWS accounts by default, and permissions to do anything in the AWS account are limited to the root user to start off with. That root user can then create the first IAM administrative users uh, within the account, and then these would be what we'd use for regular day-to-day -day activities within the AWS account. Uh, and these IAM users then need to be given specific uh, allow permissions to use different AWS services and perform various administrative functions. Essentially, the AWS account itself and permissions to use resources within it are all isolated and denied by default. We would need to explicitly configure the account IAM users and different network connectivity to gain access to the account and AWS resources. Now, just in case you're inspired to quickly go ahead and create an AWS account if you don't have one already, uh, please be patient and go through the AWS platform introduction section first, uh, just to make sure that you're aware of all the AWS account concepts and best practices first. We also want to create a new AWS account to be used for this course. Now, I'll walk through the new AWS account creation steps in an upcoming lesson. Uh, we'll create a fresh new AWS account to use so that we're all on the same page. Uh, having a clean starting point will be important if you want to follow along with a lot of the hands-on lessons uh, and experiment on your own throughout the study journey and through this course. Uh, so that's it for now. Again, thanks for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. So we discussed what an AWS account is, but let's consider how an AWS account and specifically multiple AWS accounts get used in a more real world context. 
We've learned that an AWS account are these logical boundaries of all our AWS resources and uh, administrative users by default. This isolation can be very beneficial from different security, uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, and even uh, billing and cost management perspectives. So let's explore the AWS best practices around a multi-account strategy further. Let's start off with the why. Uh, why should we use multiple AWS accounts? Now, doesn't this just seem like extra effort and complexity? Well, AWS recommends using multiple accounts for several different reasons. Uh, first, it enhances security. By segregating resources across accounts, we limit the blast radius in case of a security breach. Um, secondly, it simplifies billing and cost management, allowing you to track spending by uh, project, uh, department, or environments. Um, and then lastly, it also improves operational efficiency by enabling us to tailor permissions to uh, different resources for, uh, again, different teams or applications. Now, multiple accounts may not be needed for everyone and for every business. Uh, knowing when to actually adopt a multi-account strategy is really key to understand. If you happen to be in a growing organization and managing multiple projects or uh, need to actually adhere to uh, strict regulatory requirements, it's likely time to at least consider a multi-account strategy. A multi-account strategy is especially beneficial for companies looking to isolate different environments. Uh, if you have kind of development or staging and production environments, uh, and companies looking to uh, separate costs and have detailed uh, cost tracking across different departments. So what kind of guidance or best practices does AWS have for this multi-account strategy? Well, again, AWS provides several best practices for managing multiple accounts. First, you'll typically want to use AWS organizations to essentially manage your billing. Uh, we'll explore AWS organizations a lot later in the course, uh, but for now you can just think of AWS organizations as a way that AWS provides to give us a um, hierarchy structure to our AWS accounts and aggregate all the costs and usage together into one single management account. AWS organizations allows you to consolidate all the AWS bills from multiple accounts into one for ease of uh, accounting and payment. AWS organizations also lets us apply custom security and governance policies across our accounts. Now, while AWS organizations can help simplify billing and governance aspects across your AWS accounts, what type of account should you create in the first place? Um, do you have accounts for different teams in a company? Uh, do you have accounts for different environments, like your development and production environments? Now, the answers here vary depending on the specific needs of each organization, but AWS has a service called AWS Control Tower, that helps set up and govern secure multi-account AWS environments. The great thing with AWS Control Tower is the account structure framework it creates, uh, which is called a landing zone. Uh, and this is based on established AWS best practices and feedback from customers successfully using large multi-account environments. Again, there's a lot to cover with the AWS organizations and AWS Control Tower services, which we'll get into soon. Uh, but again, I just wanted to highlight these now so that they're um, you know, important part of the multi-account strategy conversation. These AWS services help us get a multi-account strategy in place to begin with, uh, and then help us manage and organize the accounts into logical organization units, or OUs, that uh, provide additional security and governance policies that we can apply throughout the AWS organization structure. So how do you know when it's time to adopt a multi-account strategy? Well, a multi-account strategy, again, may not be right for every organization, uh, but if you have a large number of users or applications or need to comply with strict uh, security regulations, or just want to isolate different workloads or simplify billing, a multi-account strategy can be very beneficial. If you're in an organization today and thinking about multiple AWS accounts, my suggestion would be to evaluate the business use cases for a multi-account strategy as early as possible. A multi-account AWS structure is much easier to set up when the organization is small and there aren't a ton of resources and the environment's already up and running. Setting up new AWS accounts in an entirely new uh, organization structure uh, and a new landing zone after the fact can be a lot of effort the longer you wait. Uh, there are often a lot more existing resources that need to get migrated between different accounts, uh, and it's much easier having the account structure in place early on so you can avoid or at least limit some of the uh, cleanup effort down the road. If you're in an organization looking to migrate to AWS or start an AWS, uh, I really urge you to strongly consider a multi-account strategy right from the start or as early as possible. Uh, it's unlikely you'll need anything too complex from the start, but even having a simple multi-account structure in place really early on can avoid a lot of future effort. Again, we'll look at ABS organizations and ABS control tower in future lessons, and these can help us set up the initial account baseline or landing zone for our organization and make that a simple process. 
Uh, so thanks so much for watching and see you in the next lessons. Hello, and welcome to this lesson where I'll introduce the AWS Management Console. Uh, now, some of you may not have an AWS account already or have never seen the AWS Console before. Uh, I'll be covering creating an AWS account in a later section of the course, uh, so don't really worry about following along at this point. Uh, we'll get a lot of experience with the console in later sections of the course and really how to apply all this info very shortly. Uh, this lesson is just an intro to give you an overview of what the AWS console is and really introduce you to some of the setup and navigation of the console. So the AWS Management Console is a centralized web browser-based user interface for accessing and managing all your AWS resources. The Management Console is the graphical browser-based option of managing your AWS resources, uh, just in contrast to uh, command line interface or CLI methods or other programmatical ways of using the AWS application program interfaces or APIs. Uh, so let's take a look at the AWS Management Console. Now, there's actually a few ways of uh, accessing the Management Console, uh, but just for this intro lesson here, we'll just go to the sign-in link from the uh, aws.amazon.com site. Uh, we can just go to uh, sign into the console here. We get taken to the sign-in page. Uh, we have the uh, root user or IAM user logins here. Now, understanding what the root user is and IAM users are very important, and we'll be covering these in a lot more depth uh, later on in the course. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to go ahead and sign into the console. And when you first log into the AWS Management Console, uh, you see the Management Console dashboard. Uh, and the dashboard consists of these different sections here called widgets. And these different widgets can uh, contain a variety of different information, and you can also kind of uh, move these sections around to uh, have the you know, more frequently accessed information uh, you know, higher up in the console so it's easier to navigate. Uh, we can also go down to the bottom here, and there's sort of this Add Widget section if you want to kind of add uh, your additional custom widgets to the dashboard. I just want to draw your attention to this little gear icon for the uh, Management Console settings. Uh, here we can go in and uh, change our browser to uh, dark mode, which I personally prefer a bit more. Uh, we can also go into uh, more user settings. Then we can access the display settings here. Again, we can switch between the light and dark modes and kind of see a preview of what that looks like. I'm going to select the dark mode for myself. And uh, we can also see in this favorites bar display in this top header, we can choose between just the uh, service icon only or the icon and name. Um, now, as you work with AWS services more, you'll get very familiar with the AWS icons and uh, what that icon represents for an AWS service. Uh, but if you're just starting out uh, learning AWS services, it might be beneficial to have the service name and icon together uh, so you can kind of associate the uh, icon itself to the service name. Then we can also uh, pick different sizes as well, uh, the large or small, depending on your preferences and how many uh, service icons you want to add in this uh, top header here. So you can go ahead and uh, tune this to your preferences and uh, hit Save Settings. Some other settings to be aware of are the different localization and default region settings. Uh, so from here, you can pick a, a different language for your management console, um, or also the default region. I'll touch on the region selection in the management console in just a second here, uh, but just know you can change the default region so that every time when you log into the AWS management console, uh, it sort of pre-selects that region for you. Another option you can toggle on and off is having the management console remember your most recently visited services. Uh, so when you're using the console and uh, using different AWS services, the most recently visited ones are sort of uh, provided in this list so you can navigate to them quicker. Now, the next thing I want to point out here is the region selection option. So AWS services largely fit into two main categories. Uh, we have global AWS services and regional AWS services. The regional AWS services are a scope for a very specific AWS region. Uh, for example, if you were to deploy uh, Amazon EC2 instances in a specific AWS region, those resources would only be accessible through the management console uh, when you have that region selected in the console itself. As a quick example, if I deployed some resources uh, like EC2 instances in the Canadian central region, uh, but in the console, uh, like I have selected here, 
uh, I have the North Virginia AWS region selected, I wouldn't actually be able to see the EC2 resources in the management console. I would need to go in and actually change the region in the console uh, to be able to see those AWS resources. Now this region selection option is very important to be aware of as it can certainly trip up a lot of new users. Uh, oftentimes you'll deploy resources in your AWS account in a given uh, AWS region. And then when you log into the console the next time, uh, for some reason, the uh, regions might be a, a different option there. Uh, so you can't find the resources you're expecting in the management console. Uh, so you need to be sure that you have the proper region selected here in that option. So next I'll go ahead and just click on the AWS icon just to return to our console dashboard. And then next I want to draw your attention to the account dropdown here. So from here we can see our AWS account ID and uh, we can actually just copy that to our clipboard if we want just by clicking the option. Uh, this shows up very frequently in the AWS management console that for a lot of resources there's uh, this kind of copy icon. Uh, so if you have to like copy and paste different identifiers of services, uh, th this very quickly uh, copies it to your clipboard so you can copy and paste that into different fields. Then from here, we can access more account information, uh, different things about our AWS organization, service quotas, our billing and cost management, and the different security credentials. Uh, we'll cover this in future lessons of the course, but I just wanted to draw your attention to that in the console. Uh, the next thing we'll look at is the uh, services list. From here, we can see a whole bunch of the core categories of AWS services. Uh, so we can click on compute as an example, and see all the different AWS compute services within it. We can also go ahead and actually sort of bookmark or favorite these different AWS services that we uh, use very frequently. And uh, these will actually show up in our uh, header bar here and also in our uh, favorite section. Now, another really important area of the management console is the search bar. Uh, so you can click in here or just option S to sort of jump into the search bar. Uh, now, if I wanted to find a certain uh, AWS service, I can just start typing the service name and uh, it'll kind of refine the search scope and give me a list of services. Uh, we can also see that uh, from this, it's also searching across different uh, features, resources, documentation, uh, blog articles, tutorials. This is really helpful to not only find the uh, service you're looking for in the console to uh, do any kind of management or operational activities, uh, but we can also find uh, different resources to get answers if we have questions about you know, what we're doing in the management console or about the AWS service itself. Now, if we continue to explore the toolbar, uh, this icon here is for the AWS Cloud Shell. We'll explore that in a later lesson. We can also see our uh, notification area. Uh, so if there's any uh, you know, health events or something with the AWS services, uh, we'll get notification of these here and uh, access our different uh, AWS health events. And then we can also access AWS support resources through this little question mark icon, giving us access to the AWS support center if we need to open up uh, support cases with AWS and a variety of links to access different documentation, uh, support forums, and uh, other resources. So that's it for our introduction to the AWS management console. Again, the management console is our graphical way of interacting with our AWS account and AWS resources. We'll be using the management console quite a bit throughout the course. Uh, so again, don't worry about following along at this point. Uh, you'll get a lot of hands-on experience as we go through uh, later lessons in the course. Um, so that's it. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next lesson. In this video, we're going to continue looking at the features of the AWS Management Console, and I'll introduce you to the AWS Cloud Shell. Now, we've seen the graphical browser-based AWS Management Console, uh, but there's often times we'll want to interact with the AWS resources and uh, maybe even SSH into uh, systems running on EC2 instances through a command line interface or a CLI. Now, to use a CLI with AWS, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, uh, there can be various tools and packages you'll need to download, uh, install, and configure to uh, get working properly. Uh, AWS Cloud Shell provides users an easier way to get command line access without all the setup hassles and environment configurations. AWS Cloud Shell is a browser-based terminal. 
uh, essentially giving us a command line terminal interface directly through the AWS Management Console. The AWS Cloud Shell comes pre-configured with the uh, AWS CLI tool uh, already installed and ready to use, along with a bunch of other utilities that uh, help us work with the AWS resources more efficiently. So let me show you how to access the AWS Cloud Shell in the AWS Management Console. Now, once you're logged into the AWS Management Console, you can access the AWS Cloud Shell just through this icon in the top header here. So you just click on this and you get a browser-based terminal ready to use and uh, pre-configured with a lot of uh, common utilities built in. Now, if you're accessing the AWS Cloud Shell for the first time through the Management Console, uh, you may find it takes a moment or two for the Cloud Shell terminal to uh, display on the browser. Uh, behind the scenes, it's launching a instance uh, to support the Cloud Shell itself. And it can just take a moment or two to provision that instance and uh, have your terminal ready. So you can see here with the AWS Cloud Shell, we essentially get a, a Linux-based terminal to use right in our browser. Now, one of the more important utilities that comes pre-installed with AWS Cloud Shell is the AWS CLI. Now, the AWS CLI is the command line interface that we can use to manage our AWS services. As you get more experience managing and operating resources in AWS, uh, a lot of times you may find it that it's more convenient to uh, make those changes through the command line interface rather than the uh, graphical browser-based uh, management console. AWS Cloud Shell here is giving us a convenient way to access a terminal to uh, use the CLI. Now this Cloud Shell user here uh, essentially inherits the permissions of the user we use to log into the AWS Management Console with. Uh, so whatever services uh, we can access and we have permissions to in the AWS Management Console, when we access the AWS Cloud Shell with this Cloud Shell user, we'd have access to those same permissions. Now, a great feature of AWS Cloud Shell is it allows us access to private resources within our AWS account. Uh, for example, if we had some EC2 instances launched in a private subnet, uh, just meaning that it doesn't have access to the external internet, if we needed to SSH into that uh, virtual machine instance, uh, we can do so through the AWS Cloud Shell terminal. Now recall that AWS Cloud Shell uh, under the hood is just a virtual machine instance running in our AWS account, and it has the potential to uh, access a lot of private resources within our account if it's uh, configured to do so. Uh, again, you can configure a bunch of permissions and things to prevent against that if you want to, uh, but uh, it does allow you to conveniently SSH into private resources uh, without uh, exposing those resources to the internet uh, just to SSH in. Now, I don't want to get too deep here into the AWS CLI and uh, all the different features of AWS Cloud Shell, but uh, at this point, I uh, just wanted to introduce you to the utility and how you can access it through the AWS Management Console. Uh, so that's it for now. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we'll quickly introduce the AWS Command Line Interface, or CLI. Now, as you progress in your journey to becoming an AWS Certified Solutions Architect, the AWS CLI will become one of your more essential tools you'll use. Uh, so let's get started to understand what this AWS CLI is all about. So what exactly is the AWS CLI in the first place? Well, the AWS CLI is a unified open source tool that allows you to manage and control your AWS services directly from your computer's terminal or command prompt. We can think of it as a powerful way that we can interact with AWS without having to constantly navigate and click around through the AWS Management Console to get things done. Now, one of the biggest advantages of using the AWS CLI is the automation. Uh, you can write scripts to automate repetitive tasks, saving you an immense amount of time and uh, reducing errors as well. For many operations within our AWS accounts, using the CLI can be significantly faster than clicking through the web-based console. Now, the AWS CLI is a very capable tool by itself, but the true power of the CLI shines when you integrate it with other tools, uh, different programming languages, and different automation frameworks. Now, we interact with the AWS CLI through a variety of commands that follow a specific structure. Uh, we can think of them like verbs of uh, create, list, and delete that essentially tell the AWS CLI and AWS of what we want to do. 
the AWS CLI commands are further customized using parameters and different options, giving us fine-grained control over the actions you can take and how to get things configured. Now, this command structure is similar for most AWS services. However, each service may support different uh, types of actions and require different options and parameters. Now, similar to most command line utilities, the AWS CLI has an extensive help man page to guide us through all the required and optional details for the commands. The installation of the AWS CLI can vary depending on the operating system you intend to install it on. Uh, and the configuration of the AWS CLI tool also requires the use of what are called AWS access keys to authenticate the command line user to the AWS account. The AWS access keys are like another form of username and password that are used to authenticate to the AWS account. Now, we'll cover the AWS CLI install in a later section of the course, uh, where we'll also walk through the AWS account creation, uh, also IAM users, and the AWS access key setup, and everything we need to get up and running with the AWS CLI. Now, recall that we can also use the AWS uh, Cloud Shell directly through the AWS Management Console for our pre-configured browser-based terminal, and use the AWS CLI tool through there, avoiding a lot of the initial setup steps to get started with the AWS CLI. So that's it for this very quick intro on the AWS command line interface. Uh, we should be aware now that uh, we can create and manage our AWS account and resources through the browser-based management console and also through the terminal using the AWS CLI tool. So thanks for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to introduce the AWS Control Tower service. Now, we know about AWS accounts and some of the benefits now of uh, multi-account use cases, and even how we can help manage multiple accounts using the AWS Organization service. But what if we want to get some of the out-of-the-box best practices around our AWS account structure and security best practices and other automation tools to help govern our AWS environment? Well, this is where the AWS Control Tower service comes in. We can think of AWS Control Tower as an automated service that makes it easy to deploy and manage a new AWS environment that aligns with best practices. It essentially builds upon AWS organizations, offering a higher level of setup and ongoing governance. AWS Control Tower gives you a pre-configured, secure multi-account setup called a landing zone. Now, AWS Control Tower and the resulting landing zone it creates offers these pre-built guardrails which are sort of uh, preventative and uh, detective controls that help enforce your organization's policies. Control Teller also helps in creating new AWS accounts in our organization structure, providing defined blueprints that already have your best practices incorporated with them. So why should we actually use AWS Control Tower? Well, AWS Control Tower can drastically speed up the process of setting up a new uh, compliant AWS environment. The guardrails and blueprints that are built in ensure consistency across the environment and reduce the risk of misconfigurations across all the accounts. The service is also ideal for organizations with strict security or compliance requirements and can also help simplify many of the uh, complexities in managing a multi-account architecture. So in summary, AWS Control Tower is a powerful tool for simplifying the deployment and ongoing management of uh, secure AWS environments. If you work with multiple accounts, it's definitely a service worth exploring further. In future lessons, we'll dive into AWS Control Tower a lot deeper ourselves and get into some demos and see how AWS Control Tower can really help streamline multi-account environments and help implement our security and governance controls. Uh, so that's it. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next lessons. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll introduce the AWS Config service. Now, AWS Config is a service that continuously monitors and records changes to the configuration of our AWS resources. We can think of this service as a type of time machine for our infrastructure. We can see what our AWS infrastructure environment looked like yesterday or last week or even further back. And uh, AWS Config helps us assess our AWS infrastructure and all the changes that occur within it. Um, we can assess that against different uh, compliance rules and policies. 
So why would someone use AWS Config? Well, a main benefit of the AWS Config service is that it can track changes in the environment. And this can be really helpful when you're wondering why something uh, suddenly broke in an environment. AWS Config shows you a history of changes so you can really pinpoint the cause. AWS Config is also a very valuable service for compliance auditing. Config has the built-in rules to help check you know, if your resources are set up according to different uh, security standards or company policies and uh, alert you if they aren't. Now, if the time-saving pre-built rules aren't sufficient for your organization's compliance needs, uh, you can also create your own custom rules as well. AWS Config can also be a huge time saver for operations team from a troubleshooting point of view. Again, since the service is recording all the changes going on in your environment and you can you know, basically look back in time, operations teams can quickly see the past configuration state of misbehaving resources and make problem solving that much easier. Now, similar to most AWS services, we can combine different services together to create really powerful solutions. With AWS Config, we can leverage detective and proactive evaluation of our AWS Config rules to help prevent against the creation of non-compliant resources. We could also create different workflows or uh, different event-driven pipelines to help orchestrate the automatic remediation of non-compliant resources. We'll dive much deeper with this service, along with some configuration examples in a later domain in the course. But for now, keep AWS Config in your mind as you know, a service busy keeping track of all the changes going on in your account and giving you a view back in time to how resources were configured earlier. It's a powerful service to help with compliance and auditing, along with preventing and detecting undesirable configurations and resources in your accounts. Uh, so that's it for our intro on AWS Config. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back again. In this lesson, we're going to unpack another essential AWS service, uh, especially for those of you looking to streamline the management of your cloud resources called AWS Service Catalog. So let's dive into what AWS Service Catalog is, its core functionalities, and the key benefits it offers to AWS customers. AWS Service Catalog allows organizations to create and manage catalogs of IT services that are approved for use on AWS. These services can range from virtual machine images, servers, software, databases, and everything to complete multi-tier applications. AWS Service Catalog enables you to manage your IT services portfolio and helps ensure that resources are standardized, uh, compliant, and secure all across your organization, uh, all while enabling users to quickly deploy only the approved IT services they need. One of the primary benefits of using AWS Service Catalog is around governance and compliance. By defining and deploying IT services through AWS Service Catalog, you can ensure that all the resources are compliant with your company's policies and the standards right from the start. And this centralized control mechanism reduces the risk of non-compliance and simplifies the audit process as well, as all your resources are deployed with pre-approved configurations and settings. Another significant advantage is the ability to create resources and standardize your deployments. AWS Service Catalog allows you to create a curated list of products that are pre-configured to meet your organization's security, governance, and compliance requirements. And this not only speeds up the whole deployment process, but also minimizes errors and different deviations that can occur with the, uh, manual configurations, uh, just ensuring consistency and reliability across your whole cloud environment. This efficiency and simplicity for end users is also a key benefit of AWS Service Catalog as it empowers users to quickly launch IT services without really needing the deep technical expertise or knowledge of AWS service specifics. This self-service capability accelerates the pace of innovation within organizations by allowing users to focus on their projects and initiatives rather than all the underlying infrastructure setup. Lastly, AWS Service Catalog facilitates better resource management and cost optimization. By standardizing the IT services offered and providing users with only what they need, it's easier to track and manage resource utilization and costs. Uh, and this leads to more efficient use of AWS resources and can help reduce unnecessary spending. So to quickly recap, AWS Service Catalog is a really powerful tool for managing catalogs of IT services, ensuring governance and compliance, uh, standardizing deployments, enhancing your efficiency and optimizing costs. 
Now, whether you're an IT administrator or a solutions architect or a developer, uh, understanding how to leverage AWS Service Catalog can significantly improve your organization's cloud management practices. Thank you for hanging in there through these introductory lessons. Uh, we'll get a lot deeper understanding and go through some hands-on demos of AWS Service Catalog and a lot more in a later domain in the course. Uh, so great job on your progress through the course so far. Uh, make sure you're taking breaks and taking those efficient notes as you go along here, and I'll see you in the next lesson. everyone and welcome back. In this lesson, we're diving into an exciting offering from AWS that's tailored for developers and companies looking to streamline their application development and deployment processes. In this video, we'll be introducing the AWS Proton service, the fully managed application delivery service designed to help you manage container and serverless applications with ease. First off, let's talk about what AWS Proton actually does. Now, imagine you're a developer or part of a team responsible for building and deploying applications. And you know how it goes, you're you know, wearing a lot of different hats in most developer roles today, uh, managing infrastructure configuration, uh, CI CD pipelines, ensuring everything's secure and up to date. Uh, it's a lot to juggle and they all compete for your time and attention. So AWS Proton steps in as a type of superhero, uh, taking care of all the heavy lifting involved with setting up, configuring and managing your application's infrastructure. It allows developers to focus on writing code not managing infrastructure. One of the key benefits of AWS Proton is that it automates the management of your infrastructure and code deployments. It provides predefined templates for infrastructure as code or IAC, which can be customized to suit your application specific needs. And these templates ensure that your infrastructure is provisioned consistently and reliably every single time, eliminating the, you know, it works on my machine problem. Plus, it integrates seamlessly with your existing CI CD tools and workflows, really making it a breeze to set up and manage deployments. The AWS Proton service has really been designed with both developers and platform teams in mind. For developers, it really simplifies the process of deploying applications, as developers no longer need to worry about the underlying infrastructure involved. Then for platform teams, it provides the tools needed to define and maintain the infrastructure in a way that's scalable and secure, ensuring best practices are followed across all stages of the application development and deployment. Now let's talk about some real world use cases where AWS Proton can really shine. First, imagine you're part of a fast growing tech startup. Uh, your team is rapidly deploying a series of microservice based applications that need to be deployed across multiple environments. Now with AWS Proton, you can define a standard set of infrastructure and deployment pipelines for all your microservices, ensuring consistency and reducing the chance of errors uh, and also speeding up your time to market. Another scenario could be a large enterprise looking to modernize its legacy applications. Uh, AWS Proton can help by building a framework to containerize these applications and manage them using modern serverless architectures. This not only improves the scalability and performance, but also reduces the operational overhead and costs. So in summary, AWS Proton is a powerful service that offers a multitude of benefits for AWS customers from automating infrastructure management to ensuring consistent deployments across various environments. Um, so whether you're a small startup or a large enterprise, AWS Proton can really help streamline your application delivery processes. Um, so that's a wrap for this intro lesson here on AWS Proton. I hope you found this overview helpful and are excited to explore this service further. Stay tuned for the later lessons where we dive deeper into AWS Proton and other services really learn how we can leverage them to build and deploy world-class applications. So thanks for watching and I hope you're enjoying the course and overall study voyage so far, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll explore an AWS service that's essential to help understand and maintain the health and performance of your AWS resources. Uh, in this lesson, we're focusing on the AWS Personal Health Dashboard, a tool designed to give you a personalized view of the health of your AWS services and their impact on your resources. 
So let's get started on uncovering what the AWS Personal Health Dashboard is all about. The AWS Personal Health Dashboard is your go-to resource for staying informed about AWS Service Health and how it affects your specific AWS resources. You can think of it as your personalized early warning system. It not only notifies you when AWS experiences issues that could impact your resources, but it also provides proactive guidance to really help you navigate through and mitigate potential problems. So why is a health dashboard like this important? Well, in the vast ecosystem of AWS where services are interconnected and applications rely on uh, multiple services to run smoothly, having a dashboard that alerts you to issues specifically affecting your resources is really invaluable. It means you can react quickly to address these issues before they escalate into more significant problems. Uh, one of the key benefits of the AWS Personal Health Dashboard is its ability to provide detailed alerts. And these aren't just generic notifications, they're really tailored to inform you about incidents affecting your services, uh, scheduled maintenance activities, and really other important events going on within AWS. This level of detail helps you understand the scope of an issue, uh, assess its impact, and determine the best course of action to take. The dashboard also offers actionable guidance for resolving issues. Uh, for instance, if there is a service disruption, uh, the dashboard can provide recommendations or uh, steps you can take to help mitigate the problem. Uh, this could be anything from adjusting your configurations, uh, deploying resources in a different region, or uh, simply applying updates to ensure compatibility. Now, let's consider a real-world scenario where the AWS Personal Health Dashboard could prove invaluable. Uh, now, imagine you're running a critical e-commerce platform on AWS, utilizing various services like Amazon EC2, uh, Amazon RDS databases, and AWS Lambda. Uh, and then one day there's a service disruption affecting EC2 in the region where your resources are hosted. The Personal Health Dashboard notifies you immediately, providing specifics of the incident and its impact to your resources. With this information, you can quickly take steps to reroute traffic or to scale out your resources in another region to minimize downtime for your customers. It also helps avoid wasting a ton of time troubleshooting issues. If your application starts misbehaving, uh, figuring out what's wrong could be a very complex endeavor. Uh, did something change recently with your application code? Did someone push out an infrastructure update, uh, you know, where there's a network or security group rule update? Um, did something go wrong with the database? Uh, are there load issues causing certain components to fail? Um, there's really so many areas to think about and, you know, when the pressure's on, when your production environment is down. Often one of the last things folks think about is if the issue is related to the underlying AWS services you're using. Trying to troubleshoot and isolate your application issue root cause uh, down to some intermittent AWS service API errors can be a very long and complex process. With the Personal Health Dashboard, you'll see notifications related to your AWS services you're using right away, so you can kind of cross-reference them during your investigation. There's no need to spend hours troubleshooting application code when the root cause is on the AWS services end. The AWS Personal Health Dashboard lets you focus your team's time and energy exactly where it's needed. Now, another scenario could involve scheduled maintenance. Uh, AWS might need to perform updates that affect your RDS instances. Uh, through the dashboard, you're informed uh, well in advance, allowing you to plan accordingly, uh, perhaps by scheduling some downtime during uh, off-peak business hours to ensure you have uh, read replicas in place to handle those requests seamlessly. Uh, so in summary, the AWS Personal Health Dashboard is really a critical tool for any AWS user, uh, from developers to large enterprises. Uh, it helps you stay ahead of potential issues and ensures you're informed and prepared for scheduled maintenance and really ultimately supports you in maintaining the reliability and performance of your applications. Um, now that wraps up our introduction here on the AWS Personal Health Dashboard. I really hope this overview has highlighted how valuable this tool can be in your AWS toolkit. Remember that staying informed and proactive about the health of your AWS resources is really key to ensuring smooth and uninterrupted service for your users. Uh, thanks for watching and see you in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. Now, I know we're just getting started on some intro level lessons at this point, but I think you should be able to imagine the scale and complexity that can occur in organizations that run hundreds of AWS accounts 
and use a wide array of AWS services and have many cloud workloads running on AWS. It can often feel like you're sort of flying blind when it comes to piloting all these AWS resources, sort of like you're managing a fleet of rockets without any instruments on the dashboard. Well, that's where the AWS CloudWatch service comes in. It's your trusty mission control for monitoring your cloud infrastructure. AWS CloudWatch is a cornerstone service within the AWS ecosystem, providing centralized monitoring and observability for your cloud resources and applications. It serves as a mission control center, um, aggregating metrics, logs, and all your events into this kind of centralized holistic view of your AWS environment's health, uh, performance, and operational status. So what does this Amazon CloudWatch service actually do? Well, CloudWatch offers a range of functions. Um, first, it offers metrics collection and visualization capabilities for AWS users. Um, CloudWatch gathers performance and operational data from a vast array of AWS services, uh, including EC2, RDS, Lambda, and pretty much anything you can think of. It also integrates with custom applications, allowing you to collect tailored metrics that suit your unique needs. Uh, and then you can visualize all this data through customizable dashboards, uh, helping you to quickly uh, spot patterns and different trends. CloudWatch can also help with log aggregation and analysis. CloudWatch acts as a central repository for logs generated by various AWS services and even your own applications with really powerful query and filtering capabilities. Uh, CloudWatch allows you to really dive deep into log data and covering valuable insights for troubleshooting and debugging purposes. CloudWatch also enables us to set alarms based on specific metric thresholds and use these alarms to trigger a variety of different events. Uh, when an alarm is triggered, it can notify us through channels like email or through the SNS service and even take automatic corrective actions through integrations with other AWS services. Amazon CloudWatch lets us track events related to configuration changes within our AWS environment, enhancing auditability and control as well. So let's touch on some of the core benefits of using AWS CloudWatch. CloudWatch can help provide a single unified view of your entire AWS infrastructure. And all this visibility can really help you make informed data-driven decisions about uh, resource optimization, capacity planning, and uh, resolving issues as well. Automated alarms and event tracking help you streamline incident response and proactively prevent downtime. You can offload repetitive monitoring tasks to AWS CloudWatch, freeing up your team to focus on innovation and things that actually matter to the business. By analyzing usage patterns with CloudWatch, you can correctly size your cloud resources, uh, eliminate over or under provisioning, and help control costs. CloudWatch is a crucial service for ensuring your cloud applications running on AWS remain available and responsive. You can monitor metrics like CPU usage and network traffic, setting up alarms to trigger auto-scaling actions, and ensuring your applications can handle dynamic workloads. When something goes wrong in your environment, Amazon CloudWatch provides access to logs and metrics that give you insights into the factors impacting your environment and workloads. Amazon CloudWatch can help correlate log events with changes in key metrics, helping you figure out the root cause of issues. CloudWatch's historical data and usage trends can guide resource optimization decisions. It can help identify underutilized resources, uh, candidates for right sizing and different CPU and memory configurations, or just look at opportunities to leverage spot instances or reserved instances for further cost savings. Now we'll dive into the different aspects of CloudWatch, uh, exploring CloudWatch metrics and CloudWatch logs in a lot more depth in future lessons. But for now, if you're thinking of any sort of metric monitoring or log collection and analysis, the Amazon CloudWatch service should pop right into your mind. Uh, so thanks so much for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back again. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at AWS Managed Grafana. Now, AWS Managed Grafana is a fully managed service that makes it easy to create dashboards, uh, visualize metrics and logs, and really get insights into your application's health and performance. Grafana is widely known for its powerful data visualization capabilities. And with AWS Managed Grafana, you get the best of Grafana without all the hassle and manual setup and maintenance. So why is this AWS Managed Grafana service such a big deal? Well, for starters, it allows us to visualize and analyze our data across multiple sources with ease. 
it means we can bring together data from Amazon CloudWatch, uh, Prometheus, and other third-party sources like uh, Datadog and Splunk into a single dashboard. This unified view is really invaluable for troubleshooting, uh, monitoring, and really getting actionable insights real time. One of the key benefits of AWS Managed Grafana is its seamless integration with other AWS services. Uh, for example, you can easily set up uh, IAM authentication to securely access your dashboards, ensuring that your data remains safe and that only authorized users have access. This integration extends to other AWS services as well, allowing us to quickly connect data sources like Amazon RDS, uh, AWS Lambda, um, the Amazon Elasticsearch service, and many others. So let's talk now about use cases where AWS Managed Grafana shines. Now, if you can imagine that we have to manage a complex microservice architecture running on AWS, with AWS Managed Grafana, you can create comprehensive dashboards that visualize metrics from Amazon CloudWatch, uh, different traces from AWS X-Ray, and logs from Amazon Elasticsearch Service. These Grafana dashboards can give us a holistic view of our application's performance and health, enabling us to detect and troubleshoot issues before they affect our users. Another scenario could involve a DevOps team aiming to improve their application's performance. By using AWS Managed Grafana to visualize application and infrastructure metrics side by side, the team can identify different bottlenecks, uh, understand dependencies, and optimize resource usage. So in summary, AWS Managed Grafana is a powerful tool for anyone looking to visualize and analyze their data across various sources. Its fully managed nature means you can focus on gaining insights rather than really worrying about the underlying infrastructure and configuration. Whether you're troubleshooting issues, uh, monitoring application health, or simply exploring data, AWS Managed Grafana provides a flexible, secure, and user-friendly platform for all your data visualization needs. Now that wraps up our introduction to AWS Managed Grafana. Uh, I hope this lesson has sparked your interest in leveraging the service to enhance your data visualization and monitoring strategies. Stay tuned for more lessons where we'll dive a lot deeper into the AWS services and how you can really use them together to build, optimize, scale, and monitor your applications. Thanks so much for joining me in the lesson here, and I'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. In this video, we're covering another monitoring and observability service from AWS called Amazon Managed Service for Prometheus. Now, Amazon Managed Service for Prometheus is a fully managed Prometheus compatible monitoring service that makes it easy to monitor containerized applications at scale. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, Prometheus is an open source monitoring system and time series database that's become incredibly popular for its powerful data model uh, query language, and visualization capabilities. It's very well suited for uh, Kubernetes environments, uh, but can monitor a wide range of workloads. So why is this AWS Managed Prometheus service such a game changer for AWS users? Well, one of the key challenges with managing a Prometheus environment is the operational overhead. Uh, setting up, scaling, and securing a Prometheus stack can be very complex and time-consuming. Amazon Managed Service for Prometheus addresses these challenges head-on by providing a fully managed Prometheus service. This means AWS handles all that heavy lifting related to the infrastructure management, allowing teams to focus on just the monitoring of your applications and responding to the performance. Amazon Managed Service for Prometheus really shines in its ability to scale. Uh, the service is built to handle the demands of very large-scale applications, uh, offering automatic scaling of the uh, Prometheus query engine, uh, and the storage aspects to meet the demands of really large workloads. Additionally, it incorporates AWS security features to help protect your monitoring data. Uh, this includes encryption at rest and in transit, uh, and then its integration with identity and access management services and network isolation. So if we touch on a real world use case to really illustrate the value of the Amazon managed service for Prometheus, uh, if we imagine we're running a complex microservice architecture on top of Kubernetes, as your application scales, monitoring the performance and health of each microservice becomes increasingly challenging. With Amazon Managed Service for Prometheus, we can leverage the power of Prometheus to collect and query metrics across all our services very efficiently. 
Uh, and this enables us to detect and respond to issues very quickly, ensuring the availability and performance of the applications. Another key aspect of the Amazon managed service for Prometheus is its compatibility with the Prometheus ecosystem. Uh, this means we can use the same Prometheus query language we're familiar with, uh, along with our existing dashboards and alerting rules, making the transition to a managed service smooth and straightforward. So in summary, Amazon managed service for Prometheus offers a really robust, scalable, and secure solution for monitoring containerized applications. It really reduces the operational complexity of managing a Prometheus environment, uh, allowing us to focus on really what's important and ensuring the performance and reliability of our applications. Um, so that wraps up our introduction to the Amazon managed service for Prometheus. Um, hope you have a better understanding now of how the service can simplify monitoring of containerized workloads. So definitely stay tuned for future lessons where we'll dive a bit deeper into the service and get into some demos as well. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the AWS License Manager. Now, this service simplifies the management of our software licenses from vendors such as Microsoft, uh, SAP, Oracle, and IBM, among others. Now, whether you're operating in the AWS cloud or in on-premises environments, AWS License Manager can help us stay compliant with our software licenses. So let's get started and start to explore what the AWS License Manager service has to offer. AWS License Manager makes it easier to manage your software licenses by providing a centralized platform to track, manage, and control licenses. The main goal here is to help reduce the risk of non-compliance, uh, misreporting, and all the additional costs due to over-provisioning of licenses. It's really all about giving you visibility and control over your licenses. Now, one of the key benefits of AWS License Manager is its ability to automate the tracking of software licenses. Uh, this means you can specify your licensing rules in AWS License Manager to match the terms of your negotiated agreements, and the service really takes care of the rest. It tracks your software usage and ensures that you don't exceed your license entitlements. Uh, and this automation not only saves you time, but can also help avoid potential compliance issues that can arise from manual tracking. AWS License Manager seamlessly integrates with other AWS services, enhancing its functionality. Uh, for example, it works with Amazon EC2 and Amazon RDS, allowing us to manage our licenses across our cloud and on-premises environments. Uh, this integration provides a unified view of your licenses, making it easier to manage and optimize their license usage. Now, if you look at a more practical scenario where AWS License Manager can be a huge help, um, imagine if we're running a large enterprise with numerous EC2 instances across various departments. Uh, each department uses software that requires a specific license, such as uh, Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. By using AWS License Manager, you can really define the licensing rules that correspond to the agreements with these different software vendors. The service then automatically tracks the usage of these software licenses across your EC2 instances, ensuring that you're within your license limits. And this not only helps maintaining compliance, but also optimizing your software spend by avoiding unnecessary license purchases. Another significant aspect of AWS License Manager is its ability to manage licenses in hybrid environments. Many organizations operate in a mix of cloud and on-premises environments, and managing licenses across these can be really challenging. AWS License Manager simplifies this by offering a single dashboard to manage all their licenses, regardless of where the software is deployed. This now means we can ensure our compliance across our entire IT environment without having to juggle multiple tools or systems. So in summary, AWS License Manager is an essential tool for organizations looking to streamline its license management. It reduces the complexity of managing licenses, uh, ensures compliance, and really helps optimize our software spend. Whether you're dealing with a few dozen licenses or perhaps thousands across a large multinational enterprise, AWS License Manager provides all the tools you need to manage your licenses effectively. So that wraps up our lesson here on AWS License Manager. Uh, I hope you have a better understanding now of how this service can really help you manage your software licenses more efficiently and help you stay compliant with your licensing agreements. Uh, thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome back. In this video, we're going to discuss a powerful service that can play a crucial role in managing your cloud and on-premises resources called AWS Systems Manager. This service offers a unified interface that allows us to automate our operational tasks, uh, improve our security posture, and increase our operational efficiency. So let's explore what AWS Systems Manager has in store for us. Now, AWS Systems Manager is designed to give you visibility control over your infrastructure on AWS. It provides us a comprehensive solution for managing our AWS resources, enabling you to automate routine operational tasks, uh, apply patches, configure instances, and manage your environment security posture. With AWS Systems Manager, you can group resources like Amazon EC2 instances or uh, Amazon RDS databases based on their application, allowing you to manage and automate tasks on resources collectively. One of the standout features of AWS Systems Manager is its ability to automate the management of our EC2 instances. You can remotely and securely manage the configuration of your instances. Uh, as an example, you can automatically patch instances, uh, configure our instances to comply with your company's security policies, and really ensure that all the instances are running the most up-to-date and secure software. Systems Manager also simplifies resource and application management across your AWS environment. It allows you to view operational data from multiple AWS services and automate operational tasks across your AWS resources. With Systems Manager, you can quickly identify issues, uh, make changes, and automatically apply them to your instances or containers, ensuring your applications run smoothly. Now for a real world scenario where AWS Systems Manager can make a significant impact, uh, imagine you're managing a fleet of EC2 instances that need to be regularly patched and updated. Manually tracking and applying these updates can be very time consuming and error prone. With AWS Systems Manager, you can automate this process. You can schedule patches to be applied during specific maintenance windows, ensuring that there's minimal disruption to your services. And this not only saves a lot of time, but it really helps you maintain your security posture by ensuring that your instances are always up to date with the latest patches. Another powerful capability of AWS Systems Manager is the parameter store. Uh, and this provides secure hierarchical storage of configuration data and management and secrets management as well. Uh, you can sort of store data such as passwords, uh, different database strings and license codes, uh, all as parameter values. And these can be programmatically retrieved by your application code. All this helps keep your sensitive information secure and easily manage configurations across your environment. So in summary, AWS Systems Manager is an essential tool for managing our AWS environment. It enhances our operational efficiency by automating tasks, uh, improving our security posture through the consistent application of organizations' policies, and really providing a unified interface for managing our AWS resources. Uh, so whether you're part of a small startup or a large enterprise, uh, Systems Manager can help streamline operations and really keep your applications uh, secure and running smoothly. So that wraps up our lesson here on AWS Systems Manager. Uh, again, we'll get into a lot more real-world scenarios and get hands-on with some demos with the service in later lessons. Uh, but for now, thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to focus on a service designed to help you optimize your AWS compute resources for both performance and cost. It's called the AWS Compute Optimizer. AWS Compute Optimizer is a machine learning based tool that analyzes our AWS compute resources configuration and utilization metrics. It then provides us recommendations on how to optimize these resources for performance and cost. This service supports various resource types, including Amazon EC2 instances, Amazon EBS volumes, uh, AWS Lambda functions, and Amazon EC2 auto-scaling groups. Now, whether you're looking to improve application performance or reduce costs, uh, this Compute Optimizer service delivers personalized recommendations to help achieve your goals. One of the key benefits of AWS Compute Optimizer is really its ability to deep dive into your resource usage patterns and use machine learning to uncover the best recommendations. Uh, as an example, it can suggest changing to a different EC2 instance type that might offer better performance of your workload at a lower cost. Uh, 
Um, or the service might recommend adjusting your auto scaling configurations to really better match your application's demand patterns, ensuring that you're not uh, over provisioning or under provisioning the resources. Now, if you consider a more practical scenario where AWS Compute Optimizer can really make a big difference, um, imagine if we're running a web application on EC2 instances, and over time that application's usage patterns have evolved. Your current instances might be underutilized leading to unnecessary costs or perhaps overutilized, affecting performance. With Compute Optimizer, you can receive recommendations to switch to an instance type that might be a better fit for your current needs, potentially saving us money without compromising on performance. Another great feature of Compute Optimizer is its ease of use. Uh, you don't need to be a machine learning expert to really benefit from its recommendations. The service provides a very intuitive dashboard that outlines its findings making it easier for you to understand them and simply act on the recommendations. You can also tune things a bit by specifying your preferred optimization strategy, uh, whether that's uh, cost savings or balancing cost and performance or purely focusing on performance optimization. The AWS Compute Optimizer service can really play a critical role in your overall AWS cost management strategy. Uh, by aligning your resource allocation with actual usage, you're not just optimizing for performance, you're also ensuring that you're not overspending on resources that your applications don't fully utilize. All this can lend to significant cost savings, especially for larger environments with multiple applications and services running on AWS. So in summary, the AWS Compute Optimizer service is really a powerful tool in your AWS arsenal, uh, helping you to make informed decisions about how to best configure and scale your compute resources. It really provides you with actionable insights based on advanced machine learning models, and you know they're tailored to your unique workload characteristics and performance history. So whether you're a developer or a sysadmin or cloud architect, uh, leveraging the Compute Optimizer service can really lead to better performance and more cost-effective use of your AWS resources. Now that wraps up our lesson here on the AWS Compute Optimizer service. Uh, again, this is just a introductory lesson and we'll get into some examples later on in the course. Uh, so thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one. In this video, we're diving into a service that's essential for managing application availability and scalability called AWS Autoscaling. This powerful tool ensures us that we have the right amount of resources running to handle the load on our applications efficiently. Uh, so let's explore how AWS Autoscaling can help optimize our AWS resources for performance and costs. AWS Autoscaling monitors your applications and automatically adjusts capacity to maintain steady, predictable performance at the lowest possible cost. The service provides a simple, powerful interface that really lets you build scaling plans for resources including Amazon EC2 instances, uh, Amazon ECS tasks, Amazon DynamoDB tables and indexes, as well as Amazon Aurora replicas. AWS Autoscaling makes it easier than ever to set up and manage scaling for your cloud resources, ensuring that your application receives the right amount of compute database and storage resources it needs. One of the standout features of AWS Autoscaling is its ability to scale resources across multiple services in response to changing demand. This means you can maintain optimal application performance and availability whenever the workloads are unpredictable. As an example, if your web application experiences a sudden spike in traffic, AWS Autoscaling can automatically add more EC2 instances to handle that load ensuring that your users continue to enjoy a smooth and responsive experience. AWS Autoscaling is very flexible, uh, allowing you to define scaling policies based on a variety of metrics, such as uh, CPU utilization or even custom metrics specific to your application. And this level of control ensures that your scaling strategy aligns perfectly with your application's needs and performance goals. Now, if you think about a practical scenario where AWS Autoscaling can be a real help, uh, imagine if we're running an e-commerce platform that sees fluctuating traffic levels, uh, maybe during uh, sales periods or different promotional events. By using AWS Autoscaling, we can prepare for these high traffic periods by automatically increasing the number of EC2 instances during those peak times to handle the surge in user activity. Then once that sales or promotional event is over, uh, Autoscaling can reduce the number of instances again to prevent you from incurring unnecessary costs 
all without any manual intervention. Another big benefit of AWS Autoscaling is its integration with AWS CloudWatch. And this allows us to trigger scaling actions based on CloudWatch alarms. And this integration enables a responsive and dynamic scaling environment that reacts real time to changes in our application's performance or usage patterns. AWS Autoscaling also supports scheduled scaling, uh, allowing us to plan for uh, capacity changes in advance of known events or maintenance windows. And this feature is really particularly useful for workloads with predictive behavior, such as uh, batch processing jobs that run at specific times of the day. So in summary, AWS Autoscaling is a essential service for anyone looking to optimize their AWS environment for both performance and cost. Uh, it provides all the tools you need to ensure that your applications are always uh, running at the desired capacity and dynamically adapting to changes in demand without manual intervention. Now, whether you're managing a single application or uh, orchestrating a complex multi-service architecture, uh, AWS Autoscaling can help you maintain performance, uh, help you reduce costs, and really ensure your resources are efficiently utilized. So that wraps up our lesson here on AWS Autoscaling. Uh, like most of these introductory lessons, we'll be diving a lot deeper into AWS Autoscaling and a lot of other services later on in the course, and seeing some real-world application and demos of how the service works. So thanks again for joining me in the lesson, and see you in the next one. Welcome back. In this lesson, we'll explore an incredibly powerful service that almost acts like a backbone for automating and managing our cloud resources called AWS CloudFormation. Also in the lesson, we'll unravel the concept of infrastructure as code, or IAC, which is really a pivotal principle that CloudFormation is built upon. Now, infrastructure as code, or IAC, is essentially just a method for us to manage and provision our uh, cloud resources through machine-readable definition files uh, rather than doing everything manually. It allows us to essentially treat our infrastructure as if it were software. Uh, we can write code to define our servers, uh, databases, our networks, and other resources, uh, which then can all be uh, versioned and reused and shared. Now, with AWS CloudFormation, uh, this service takes the concept of infrastructure as code, offering a way to model, uh, provision, and manage AWS resources and uh, also third-party resources by writing templates that are simple uh, declarative text files. AWS CloudFormation allows us to use a simple text file to really model uh, and provision and automate in a secure way uh, all the resources needed for our applications across different regions and accounts. Uh, this kind of configuration file serves as the single source of truth for our cloud environment. AWS CloudFormation provides several key benefits. Uh, first, it automates and simplifies the process of deploying and managing your cloud infrastructure. Uh, you can create a template for your infrastructure's desired state, and CloudFormation takes really care of the rest, ensuring that your resources are provisioned and configured in the right order with all the correct dependencies. Another significant advantage is the ability to manage our infrastructure as code. Uh, and this not only improves the productivity by removing all the manual processes, but also enhances consistency and compliance across our infrastructure. With CloudFormation, we can quickly replicate your uh, infrastructure to different environments like uh, development, uh, testing, and production, ensuring that each environment is essentially identical. And this eliminates the whole kind of, uh, you know, it works on my machine problem, and everyone is working in the same infrastructure configuration. Now, if you look at it sort of a real-world use case, uh, imagine if we're deploying a multi-tier web application again on AWS. Normally setting up this infrastructure would involve uh, provisioning Amazon EC2 instances, uh, configuring an Amazon RDS database, uh, perhaps setting up an elastic load balancer, and so on. Now with CloudFormation, you can define all these resources in a, a template. And then when you deploy the template, CloudFormation automatically creates all the uh, specific resources uh, making it really easy to build and replicate your infrastructure across different environments. AWS CloudFormation also offers detailed control and safety mechanisms, uh, including rollbacks and updates. So if a deployment fails, uh, CloudFormation can automatically roll back changes to a previous state, uh, minimizing your environment downtime. Additionally, when you need to update your infrastructure, you can simply modify your existing template and redeploy it. Uh, CloudFormation takes care of updating the resources in a controlled and predictable manner. 
So in summary, AWS CloudFormation is an essential tool in the modern cloud toolkit, uh, embodying the principles of infrastructure as code. It really automates the deployment of your infrastructure, allowing you to focus on building applications rather than managing all the you know, resources and configuration. Now that wraps up our intro lesson here on AWS CloudFormation. We'll be getting a lot more in depth in AWS CloudFormation in future lessons and walking through some of the uh, templates as well and how those work to actually uh, provision our resources in an automated way. Uh, so thanks so much for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this video, I'll introduce a tool that's sort of like having a uh, guardian angel watching over your shoulder as you navigate the vast sea of cloud computing and AWS. Uh, this tool is called the AWS Trusted Advisor. So what is this AWS Trusted Advisor? Now, imagine you're building a house from scratch for the first time. Um, ideally, you'd want to have an expert on your team that has the collective wisdom of seeing uh, millions of houses being built already. Uh, they can then use all this experience to help guide you through the best practices they've already learned and help ensure your house build uh, be successful and designed to your unique needs. This expert can help tell you if you're using the right materials, uh, if you're building it strong enough to withstand storms, and uh, if you're getting value out of your home that you're building based on the uh, you know types of material you're using and the amount of material. AWS Trusted Advisor is essentially this expert home builder built for your AWS environment. Uh, it inspects your account resources and configurations and helps offer recommendations to improve performance, uh, reduce security risks, and optimize costs. The Trusted Advisor tool has a number of checks that correspond to the AWS Well-Architected Pillar Areas, uh, which is essentially a framework that we'll be diving into much later on in the course. Now, again, the Trusted Advisor is like having this expert guardian angel watching over your AWS account and helps ensure that you're getting the most out of your AWS account without overspending or compromising on performance and security. This tool is particularly helpful for those that are brand new to AWS, uh, or even those that are experienced in managing large complex environments where they may not be aware of all the best practices, or uh, they have environments so large and complex that it's essentially near impossible to keep a watchful eye on everything going on within all those accounts. For a quick example use case, uh, AWS Trusted Advisor can suggest which underutilized EC2 instances to downsize, saving you money without affecting performance. And it's not just limited to EC2 instances, though. Uh, it offers cost optimization advice across a number of services and other areas within your AWS environments. It's like having a financial advisor for your AWS account. Another example in the security area, uh, AWS Trusted Advisor checks your environment against a number of security best practices. If it finds an uh, unsecured S3 bucket or overly permissive IAM roles, it'll flag these issues. These proactive checks of Trusted Advisor can help prevent potential breaches before they even happen. So in summary, AWS Trusted Advisor is your tool for keeping your AWS environment efficient, secure, and cost-effective. Now, whether you're part of a, a small startup or a large enterprise, Trusted Advisor provides a bunch of insights that can really improve the value you get out of your AWS cloud spend and your overall security posture. Uh, so that wraps up our introduction to AWS Trusted Advisor. Uh, we'll get to some demos of this tool later on in the course, uh, but until then, thanks for watching and see you in the next lesson. Welcome back. In this lesson, I'll introduce a tool that can help design and operate reliable, secure, efficient, and cost-effective systems in the cloud. I'm talking about the AWS Well-Architected Tool. Now, first off, what is this AWS Well-Architected Tool? Well, in simple terms, it's a service provided by AWS that helps you review the state of your workloads and compares them against AWS best practices. We can think of it as our cloud architect buddy uh, guiding us to you know, help make our applications more secure, uh, scalable, and uh, high-performing. So why should we care about this AWS Well-Architected tool? Well, the tool itself can significantly improve your workload's overall design, 
uh, performance and uh, also help reduce costs. And it does all this by helping you identify areas where your architecture deviates from the AWS's six pillars of their well-architected framework. Uh, and these pillars are their uh, operational excellence, uh, security, uh, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and sustainability. Now again, this AWS well-architected framework topic comes into the picture again, and we haven't really covered it too much in the course yet. I uh, just know that we cover this uh, very important topic much later in the course. For now though, just know that this well-architected tool gives us AWS users a user-friendly way to review workloads against all the design principles and best practices of the well-architected framework. Uh, we'll get into what the framework is and what these six pillars are all about in a future section in the course. So when would we actually use this well-architected tool? Well, imagine if you're deploying a new application uh, before going live or even ideally earlier in your software development lifecycle. You can use this well-architected tool to ensure your workload design and supporting infrastructure is properly designed and has really taken into account a wide variety of best practices. The tool will give you a checklist of improvements uh, making sure your application launch goes as smooth as possible. Another scenario could be optimizing an existing application. Uh, maybe your app's running slower than expected, or the costs of running that application are sky high. Uh, the well-architected tool can help identify uh, potential bottleneck areas, or suggest ways to help streamline operations, uh, making the app run faster and more cost-effective. So in summary, the AWS well-architected tool is like having a seasoned architect review your work. It's really an invaluable resource for anyone looking to build or maintain cloud-based applications, ensuring that they're not just functional, but well-architected. Remember that well-architected cloud workloads are the foundation of a successful cloud journey. The well-architected tool can help ensure you stay on the right path and avoid costly pitfalls along the way. Uh, so that's it for this lesson. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one.